Welcome to our YouTube channel as we bring you another exciting edition of The Point of View. We have a big guest for you today, Dr. Kofi Kunedo Apreku. He's been attempting to be MPP flag bearer since 1996. Tonight he'll be telling us why he wants to lead that party in their upcoming Congress. Subscribe to our channel, like and share the video. We'll be back with that interview. Welcome back. So my guest is a very, very interesting man. And I'll give you a quick overview of who he is before I speak to him. Uh, he, he's interesting. He was born in a Kumadan uh, to illiterate parents. Uh, was in a primary school in a Kumadan growing tomatoes with his mother. A few years later, in secondary school at Chene, Boakodia Secondary School in Kumeu, he won a scholarship after writing an essay straight from the Ashanti region to Oregon, where he went to the, a high school, then, of course, did his undergraduate degree, master's, PhD. He's an agri economist, worked in, the, in three universities in North America, taught finance and economics from 1983 to 1996. Of course, he met Professor Edu Boahin, convinced him to come back to Ghana, come and help to do politics, because at the time, the main task was to remove Rolex or remove the NDC. Uh, it became part of that very uh, powerful parliament from 97 to 2001, where in many ways they defined opposition politics. People like him, Osafo Mafu, J.H. Mensah, Kufuado and co. And of course, in 2007 was one of the 17 men who wanted to lead the MPP. He's done many things after that, works with ECOWAS and all of those. He's part of the campaign. Doc, good to see you. Welcome to City. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be on your program. Uh, you, I, I'd give a very short history. There's a lot more to the history. But for those of us in the media, we missed the 96 parliament because I was in secondary school before university and we watched on TV. And some of the names I remember, obviously J.H. Mensah, Nana Kufuado himself. Then there was Yao Safumafu. You were the spokesperson for finance. There was Kwame Nabatels. And I think there was maybe Banredu and a few others. Jacob H. Blamte wasn't in parliament. How, how uh, iconic was that group? Well, I think that was a period. I, they say that every period defines the priorities and creates individuals who carry the torch. Mm. And we just so happened to be, at that time, our moment. It was our moment. Why? We had been in, under military dictatorship, one of the worst that can be imagined, and gone through all kinds of programs and processes, people agitating all the time. Those of us who were overseas, we formed groups, and we tried our best. We made contributions. Mm. We were determined to remove this dictatorship and it didn't work. I came back here, and then we had a platform. Even begin before we went into office, we had started setting up the structures for a political party. We had defined what kind of political party mm. we wanted to have. Okay. What are the objectives that we want to accomplish? Mm -hmm. What would be the basis to ascertain whether we have been successful or not? We set all the benchmarks mm -hmm. and went to work. Mm -hmm. The first attempt we made, you recall, the elections we felt had been stolen in 92. So we, we boycotted the second phase. And the younger people amongst us may not know that at that time, you do the presidential first. And then after that, you do the parliamentary. And so when we went in and Professor Dubois lost, or supposedly lost, was, well, we felt like the verdict was stolen. And so when that happened, we did not go to parliament. So they had a field day, they could do whatever they had. They had all the numbers. The next time we went out and then we yeah. changed it. Let me ask, so you were 66 in that 96? That period. I remember. The NDC now, number uh, was about, about 130. It was 200 seats. Yeah. Do you think that if you had gone for the parliamentary in 92, you would have made some significant numbers in even that parliament? Given the effort we put up yeah. and the resource that we got at that time, mm. 
many are inclined to believe that perhaps we would have er eradicated the, that political environment that we had. Mm. If we had gone, it would not so you, have sunk as deep. So because obviously they, yeah. they did whatever they want. There yeah. was no challenge. Mm. We were working very hard outside parliament. But, it wasn't but it's working. not the same. So you probably would have had four years of experience in opposition parliament. Yes. So that the 96 parliament may have been more effective. No doubt in my mind. Did the 2000 election come a bit early? Because in many countries, Rawlings had been in power for at least a decade before he became a, a democratic elected president, and he won in 92 and 96. So it's almost 19 years, right? But you can say only two elections, and then quickly the MPP comes to power. In retrospect, what was the key to MPP's victory in 2000? We were properly organized. The people themselves had realized that we were treading on the wrong, mm -hmm. treading to a wrong end. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're looking for uh, options. Mm -hmm. And we maintain ourselves and behave very well in mm. opposition. Mm. Discipline, we knew the issues. And we made people believe that we represented their hopes and aspirations. Mm. So they can identify with us. So, and the world was listening. Mm. Because we were going through a very difficult process. Very seldom does it happen that a military detector having uh, gone through the processes of so many years of de dictatorship is giving an option to participate in the next elections mm -hmm. where he controls the system and he had controlled it for so long. So the expectation everywhere was that somehow there will be some divine intervention mm. for us to win. And when we got the 66, in our own minds, mm -hmm. it was not the opposition. We felt we represented the people. So it was a victory. Hope. So even it though was it was victory. like a third. Yes, it was a victory. To have even what countries. had happened before. Mm. So that is the environment with which we went into parliament, mm -hmm. the situation, and indeed the expectations of our people were very high. Anything was better than what we had. Mm. And so the public support was incredible, solid. So the, the 2000 victory in a way was inevitable because Rawlings was no longer on the ballot. And this was a new candidate. Bakufu had been tried in 96. Yes. And, but in 92, you were with Edubwa in 92. You were with Edubwa in 92. Yes. You were Edubwa in 92. I'm saying you personally. Me. Edubwa yes. was your mentor. Oh, yes. He, he brought person. me. He yes. got me to come to But 96, country. in that context between Edubwa and Kufu, and I think a Kufu Adu, I'm not sure. Did, who did you support? You mean 90, that, For the 96 yeah. MPP primaries. For the Pro Professor Edubwa, he did not participate in the 90, war. Yes. I represented <laughs> him, he <in the> says. <laughs> I see. But I was in the race. I came third. You came third? Yes. Exactly. President Kufu, Nana Kufuado, or President Kufuado, mm -hmm. and I was the third in that race in Sunyani. So, so you, you came ahead of JH? JH was about the last in that. <laughs> yes, I believe he was either last, but one or so. But yes. That, that's almost. Then you were very young. That's about 25 years ago. That's why they were calling me the green grass. Everybody felt I was too young and that there is an opportunity to grow this grass wow. into the future. Yes, I was very young, 20 something. I think not even 30 yet. So it means you've been trying to, to, <laughs> to become president since 1995. <laughs> So, right, and that's how many years ago? 28 years ago. All my life almost. <laughs> but but what, you've done so much. You're an economist. You've taught. You've been an MP. You've been Minister for Trade. You've been Minister for NEPAD. Most people don't even achieve one-tenth of that. So why, why? You're almost 70 years old now. Why are, you still, why are you still in this thing? They said to those for whom much is given, a lot is expected. I feel like uh, my work is not done. And you I feel like your work is not done? Yes. I'll come to that. I want to just work on the history a bit. Who were some of the... How, how was it like working in that 96 parliament again? Akufuado was there. Osafu Mafu was there. Who else was there? Was Michael Kui in that parliament? Michael Kui sure. was. I he, he was not. So. No. He was not. I think he came later. But Hakman was there. Hakman was there. You remember 
we were seated according to the portfolio that you have. Okay. The highest ranking portfolio in this business is foreign minister. So the spokesperson, that time we didn't have foreign minister, we have spokespersons for that. So we had Mr. Usa Jema as the first seat. He was the spokesperson. Because Obed was the foreign minister. Obed Asamo was the foreign minister side, for, the, for yes, the government. Yes. So he was the ranking. So ha the Hakuman highest. would be the, the foreign guy yes. opposing Obed. Yes. He yes. spokesperson for foreign affairs. And I think... And... I think either I came before Nana Kufuado. Because you were ordinary. finance. Yeah, and then I think I was second, and the president Kufuado was third. And then so will down, Kufuado down, be down. like the, the AG, the, the, the legal? He was, yeah, the, he was then in the legal, but eventually became a spokesperson for, or, uh, yeah, spokesperson for, for legal. For, for, and I think Kwame Nabatels was working No, for housing. foreign affairs. Eventually. Yes, for foreign when affairs. we got the power. Yeah. But in the position, yes, he was. In that mood, three or four when October. MPP won elections in 19, 2000, a lot of people expected you to be finance minister, but you were made trade minister. And Osafoma, who was an engineer, became the finance minister. Was that well, was that a surprise for you? Not completely, but I can I don't want to talk about why it came to that point. But it was it wasn't. I knew. I knew that was going to happen. That you could not, it, it, it was possible. It's not a question of not impossible. Mm -hmm. Events, events created that situation. So. I see. Yeah. What, what is your. Because I think almost every one of us became a minister for the area in which they held the portfolio as a spokesperson. Probably except you. Yes. Is that the beginning of your problems in MPP? <laughs> Oh, no, I don't no, want no, to no, that's, that's the problem. But, uh, but let me just ask, how do you assess the performance of the government that you were part of in the first four years of Kufu? Uh, taking over from the Rawlings, gold prices had collapsed prior to the uh, NDC defeat. There was also cocoa prices not doing well. So there was a, an economic crisis. Tremendous. We yes. were hippic. Yes. You may recall yes. that we have been declared hippic, highly indebted poor country. Mm. Look at the words that I describe. Highly indebted, poor country. There's nothing that is valuable about that mm. or redeemable about that. So we were poor. Mm. And we had to move out of that poverty. And I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I was a member of that team. We worked like our life was coming to an end. We worked and we had a good leader in President Kufu. He guided us. And we all delivered our best. And our best was accepted by Ghanaians as being a, a signal of the need for a change. So if I ask you who the best president in our First Republic has been, I know you better now. You say it's Kufo. Uh, your, that is your answer, too, it seems to me. No, I'm just asking. <laughs> because of where, where your, 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 your trajectory is going. It, yes, well, if I want to be honest, I think the records will show that. You know, these things, they say, what, facts don't lie or something to that effect. The records are there. One can look at the records. And I think we, it was a turning point in our nation's history. We you began part, to do things right. Were you part of the second term of Kufo? Because you had become, Nepa, so you were trade first half, and then Nepal the regional cooperation, no, second half of the first no, term. No, I was... I was the latter part that I was moved to. Nepal. Nepal. Oh, so you were trade for the first term? Yes. Completely. And then the sec so in the second, second term, term. Yeah. you were yeah. you were yeah. you were I, I see. So in the second term of Kufu as well, how I'm asking this because you lost the election narrowly in two thousand and eight. How do you compare the two terms? Of the, of before. I don't think perhaps we lost the election because we had performed poorly. I think basically we were on the right trajectory and we were doing well with respect of the economy. We had all kinds of internal problems that may well have contributed to our defeat. But I cannot isolate it strictly to poor performance. Kufu's record on our record it's been very solid. Do you think that the way the internal elections to replace Kufu was managed contributed to your defeat? I think so. I think so because when 
President Kufuado, then candidate Kufuado, won in at the uh, Legon. Legon. He told me at right there that I was going to be his campaign manager. And so I was at the center of this campaign. And I realized that we had a lot of internal problems. It may well have contributed. I cannot allocate the percentage of which came from there. But there's no doubt in my mind that we were going through a very difficult time. Was it like time. a battle of attrition? The 17 and the campaign had created some gaps. The, the impression we got from the media was that the favorite candidate in that election was Alan Chamatin, even though it was not explicitly said. So covering from our side, we felt that the 16 of you felt that he had an unfair advantage, for which reason you didn't even do a second round. So once Akufado won the first round and he hadn't even made a 50, the party felt it wasn't necessary to even do a round two because there was no way any of your, the, the 15 of you was going to give your support to anybody than Akufuado. <laughs> uh, that's the impression we get. I don't know whether you can confirm this. I cannot because I did not do any survey. Mm. And I, so obviously, it was speculative. Mm. But I know, you know, sometimes the human nature, mm. you tend to support the underdog. People felt that there were all of us who are products and we all look to the president as his brothers or younger brothers and all that. Therefore, if there's a contest, let, it, let the best person win. And maybe because it did not happen like that, and it became almost public knowledge that somehow the president may have been supporting. I don't have the evidence, but this is speculative. And maybe that speculation has some element of truth that when it started like that, a lot of the leaders of our party drifted away. And I think it, was, it wasn't so easy. Because even when it was announced that Mr. Chire Martin had left, if you heard the statement that uh, Mr. J.B. Darocha said, let him go, you know, that was his first instinct, let him go. You know, that ought not have been the response, given the state in which we were in. But it's a demonstration of the sentiment that was the out time. there mm. in the larger part of the party. Mm. People felt that the process and the intervention may not have been justifiable uh, to the point that we all have been in this business. We fought through. Allow a free fight. Yeah, and particularly somebody who may not have been in the direct he, 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 yeah, because some of you are more senior yeah. in the yeah. party's history. Yeah. Although he does say that he was involved using the young, uh, I uh, think, uh, yeah, young patriots. So there are different levels of entry of a party, right? Yes, different levels. But the thing of the man, the, 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 it was obvious, the leaders of the party. Mm -hmm. In part because we were in parliament. And when you are in opposition in your parliament and you are in parliament, that is where the action is. And when we became in position, he was not there. In government, he was not there. So you begin to wonder, you know, how did that happen? And some of us were open-minded enough to mean that it should not have influenced anything. We mm. all work hard to redeem whatever is left. But many people did not feel that way. Mm. So two questions there, then we move forward. The and the other one okay. that may has also made it even difficult is when he said he had resigned. Yes, and then but Darucha said he can go. He said he can go. And you know, when a man like Darucha speaks like that, it doesn't help. But was it fair for somebody to also say they were leaving the party because I'm not saying angry? that Darucha was wrong. I'm saying that it doesn't help the process the of whole healing. Thing. Yeah. If you want to heal, then maybe you may feel that way, but maybe not say it publicly. Um, you are the only person from that group, I, I'm talking about the 96 group now, that is still actively trying to be president. Everybody else has either moved on, like Akufado is president, Osafo Mafu, senior minister, he's not interested anymore. Um, I, Hackman, no. Barrett is no longer here. Bartels, we don't hear much about. Okwe, Speaker of Parliament. Baradu is dead. 
why are you the only person of that group that is still active? Like, it's almost like they're all on retirement. Akufado is the last of that generation. Why is Kofi Kronenda Preku still actively? Do I look like somebody who should be on retirement? I'm not sure. I'm not, <laughs> no, like, but you have to also understand, when we were in parliament, I was one of the youngest persons in parliament at the time. Of that group? Yes. Yes, I was really young. So the people, the names I've mentioned are your seniors in age? All of them. But I don't come close. Some of them, their children may be even older well, than you I are, am. You are, you are, I, I think you are 68 or Something six, like 69. Something like that. I don't know. I'm <laughs> only 50. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, because you were born in 1954. Yes. So you are a year shy of 70. Oh, no. Oh? I don't know. I don't feel it, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I mean, it's, I do not put this. The, but I'm saying that there were senior most people there. But you are okay. Let's just ask a question of the 10 competing now. I think, but a free Akoto, the former Greek minister, you are the oldest. I don't know because a free, I don't know. Do, do are you older than he is? Oh, I can't be older than him. I cannot, he's older than so I a free am. must be older than you for sure. Uh, I don't know about Jogati. I don't know. You are older than Jogati. I, I can confirm you're older than Jogati. Oh, okay. I think you're older if, than Jogati. If, if that is the case, yes. maybe. So I you may... are the second oldest. But yeah. in terms of um, attempts for the flag bearership, you are certainly the oldest of that group. No. In terms of many times? Yes, I'm talking about in terms of frequency of competition. No. Alan is? Alan may be because he's practically competing. When, no, when, when, when I say you are the oldest, I mean you are the first to have attempted. You are tempted, oh, yes. yes. So oh, I'm saying, oh, I'm, yeah, yes, there's no have, question. Yes, yes. yes. So I am the, the yes. oldest. Yes. From 96. Yes. All the way through to 2023. Yeah. That, that's incredible. Yeah. It, it, what's the difference between this race now, the 10 of you, and the race you were involved in, the 17? What's the difference? Well... There are less people. There are fewer, <laughs> there are fewer people. That's a major difference. Okay. Um, otherwise, I think the campaign is more friendly, for one thing. Okay. I see we, we, okay. we don't have antagonism against each other. There is a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of maturity. And, and we have been through the processes. Many of them have competed so many times. They know the process. They, 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 and, and the system, I believe, generally, generally, in general, and not in this particular one, but in general, all the other subsequent elections have been really fair and open. So that, that helps. We'll talk a bit more about this. My guest is Dr. Kuvik Renda He is the, I have to qualify this, he is the most experienced of all the 10 running for MPP flag bearer because he ran first in 96. He actually came third to Akufuado and Kufuo. So Kufuo was first, Akufuado was second, he was third. Kufuo was president, Akufuado is president. So who knows, he may be the next. It's only natural. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come and talk about that and also talk a bit about his message to delegates, his message to the country, and also how the MPP itself hopes to sell itself because the economy is not doing well. And that appears to be the main focus for the election. Stay with us. An aspirant, 10 of them running for or competing for the MPP flag bearership. In August, they will go for the first round. And then in November, round two, he's confident he will make both the first and the second round. He is the most experienced campaigner for the flag bearership of the MPP. Sorry, we, we left off before the break with a, a question I feel we should segue back into. So when I ask you the similarities, you said the election, this one is a bit more, less attritional, fewer people. Obviously, you've learned your lessons. But I get the sense that there's the same type of thing where in the 2007, there was a favorite candidate in Ireland. And this time, the vice president appears to be the same, that person. So that's the similarity. Mm -hmm. you, you confirm this, won't you? I will. I will. You have observed it. I have observed it. I think that everybody has a sense of it. Whether it's real, true or not, that is the reality. And, and that is what is going around. But 
are you managing it better than because you said the election is less attrition i've listened to some campaign messages some of your colleagues i won't say it's not insulting at all but it's very it's very stark and very blunt some of the things i'm hearing on the campaign trail all right for example we played a report of kennedy japon speaking to delegates to an extent alan as well you can tell for example they talk about baumia why are we calling him an economic messiah when we have gone back to the imf and we've mismanaged the economy and this is an internal election but that is an is there's no problem we're dealing with the reality if you're a messiah and you can't heal your home what kind of messiah are you this i think this is completely acceptable this is politics we're competing politics is competition of ideas mm. your ideas against my idea your vision against my vision and in that interrogation everything should be open i would resent it if somebody were talking about say ethnicity mm -hmm. i resent it if somebody was being personalizing the campaign those having surface but when we are looking at our records obviously if you want to govern this country and you have been involved in anything that comes close to governing the country we have a right to examine how you have handled it then for the 10 of you five of them should be able to answer not just him so he the trade Everybody former trade minister should. a greek minister railway oh. minister so apart from you kabne jepong kojo poku and maybe adainimo the rest of them should all have some levels of why should they not mm. they want to get we want us to play the destiny of this country in their hands they have a, we have a responsibility to interrogate what have they done what have been the results and can we live with them for a second or third period that's a very fair fair assessment I but would you say that you do not hold any responsibility for the record of the mpp at all why i do i do hold response i i i i would be held responsible if nothing at all because people do have mpp and things are difficult they would, they would talk to me about it they feel muny na mo wo ho na mo ay say that that is only natural i cannot escape the fact that i'm a member of this party and a senior member of this party and so when things go well i'm very very happy things go wrong i care because a lot of people will call me and and unfortunately for me i wasn't even in this country i was in ecowas as economic um, macroeconomic policy commissioner for ecowas economic policy and economic uh, research research you know so i wasn't here and so maybe i'm so out of touch with them but when i came back people call and say why is it this why were you not part of it maybe you could have done this maybe you could have done that that is all speculative but as long as i'm mpp i cannot escape responsibility the way governance works are you able to influence the economic direction without necessarily being an appointee because i know akufado has been in power now 70 years or 6 years you've not, you were not appointed by him at all in either of his terms but because you are a senior member of the party an economic mind with your experience was it possible within this or has it been possible rather within his six years to make any input into his economic governance no not possible. not not directly no so even as except, ecowas commissioner except uh -huh, that's what i was doing except with my work with my work my responsibility as, as the commissioner for macroeconomic policy and economic research we go to member countries i send my team they mm. come to ghana mm. and collect data information about all the mm. important aspects of the economy yeah. we analyze it and we publish it and we invite the president to come for the summits that we have and we work very closely with the minister of finance and the governor of the central bank they are basically the two leading policy makers in this area so we share the results and i'm the commissioner so i'll make a presentation mm. of what has been accomplished or what has been observed for all the 15 16 member countries okay and ghana report will be sent to them to also examine so when they come 
the, can we all working towards a common agenda? The common agenda is to have a single currency. To have a single currency, we have set criteria, okay, that every country must meet in order to have a successful uh, mon one monetary policy, one single currency, and all the other attributes that go with it. Yeah. And so we assess each country. Mm -hmm. If the country is doing well, we publish their results. Does the nature They're of doing... your work allow you to see where the economy is going? I ask this because we are in July 2023. July 2022, everything went south. The exchange rate went through the roof. Inflation started going up. The central bank started raising its policy rate. A lot of the economic fundamentals went out of kilter in July 2022. Were you able to see this? Did you see this coming of in course. the work you were doing? Well, Did you warn Ken Oforiata about it? He, I, I can't warn him. I can't be you can't draw his warn. Yeah, that this, <laughs> yes. as in, like in May, I can see where your debt is but going. Let me, what I have, <laughs> yes. he will have. We prepared the reports. We circulate it. All right. We review it. My team will come here, gather the information. They bring yeah. it. Yeah. I will review with it with them. Mm. We do all that needs to be done. Where we need additional information to feel like we are on a solid ground, we send them back. Mm. They collect it, they will collect that. After all that is done, we send a copy of the report to the governor of Central Bank, in this case, Ghana, governor of Central Bank, and uh, uh, um, finance uh, minister, minister, for all the member countries. They review it and we schedule a meeting in which we go and discuss it. After that, the presidents also meet and discuss these reports. So it's nothing that is hidden. So this is more like historical data, trend analysis. It's not predictive. It's predictive because we are projecting. Based on this, we can project. Which is what I'm asking you. Oh, so yes, around yes, March, yeah, April, did yeah. you see... Because there was a major exit of portfolio investors in Ghana in July. And by August, everything we was We saw down. all that. Did you warn Ghana? What I see, I don't know how many times I have. Yes, whatever, not only Ghana. We send our reports of our observations to all the member countries. Wow. Now I have repeated it, honestly. That's what we do. And so, they come and they will defend some, say maybe this is not like you think. We do exchange. And this is a professional. I, I ask this because some people have said that we ought to have taken the IMF decision earlier. For example, we, we went to IMF kicking and screaming because the finance minister has said that as m early as March, we're not going to go to the IMF because E-Levy was better and the IMF had nothing good for us. The opposition leader at the time said, call a national consensus and go to the IMF. They did not listen. By July 1, we were with the IMF. The president wrote a letter signed by the information minister. Finance minister should meet the IMF and begin negotiations. <laughs> so that felt very messy. <clears throat> right, and so I'm asking, as an economist who was watching this from outside, did you know that it would end at the IMF? Should we have gone earlier, for example? Well, I think my own view is that yes, we should have gone earlier because the signals on the wall suggested that we do not have the capacity to address this issue here with whatever levy that we were going to implement. The quickest and the best option available to us was this. Mm -hmm. Whatever you like it or not, that's the reality. And that is my assessment. And I think, in retrospect, many people will come to that conclusion too. Mm. So, but then, of course, and that also says something about the leadership, right? Because I remember distinctly when the debate about HIPIC came, on the radio, it was a very sentimental debate. Ghana is a rich country. We can't go to HIPIC. Kufos is yeah, going HIPIC. Right? He took yeah. the decision yes. after family. meeting Safoma for family. Here you have February, March, April, go for IMF, you're not going. Then by July you go. So you go in a weaker position. And now you have a deal which may not necessarily have been the deal you'd have got. So, I mean, we can't absorb the president, can we? Ah, I don't think the president has asked you to absorb him. He's the president of this country, mm -hmm. for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is an issue. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this in the sense of the quality of leadership that we have now compared to the, the well, leadership that you were part of. <laughs> what are you expecting me to say? That one is better one? I don't know. The you, reality on the ground, within this contest yes. of the question you have asked, mm -hmm. did we do the thing 
the appropriate thing at the appropriate time. That's basically what you're yes. asking. Yes. Reality now said that we, we, we should have done it earlier. That's the reality, the results that we hold. And you talk about HIPIC. I was involved very much in the first HIPIC that we got. When we came to government, George, President George Bush had, Bush had already invited the president of Ghana, who had extensive, President Kofu, extensive network in the US. I lived there, but I didn't even realize until I went on this mission. To come to the inauguration, he said he could not go because the inauguration comes before ours. Therefore, he can't go in any capacity other than the president. So he called Mr. Udui Sykes, who was the chairman of our party, Mr. Kwabna Daakon, who was a very good friend and had an extensive network of friends. And he asked me, the three of us, to go and represent him. And in the process, told me about this pending HIPIC, that we should meet some congressmen and discuss that possibility of Ghana becoming a HIPIC country. We did. We did go. We went to the inauguration. After that, we had all kinds of meetings on this issue. When we came back, there was an American delegation that came here. And if you come to my office now, the picture is there, where I'm me, president, and Mr. Kwabreda with that delegation. Went to Akosumbu and worked on the processes. That time, we had people already in positions. When we started, we had not taken office. So I could not mm. have gone because I wasn't even the finance minister. Mm -hmm. But then the, the discussions transferred to the finance ministry. So President Kofu anticipated the, the, the challenge that was there and acted before it got worse, acted at the very best time. Because President Bush, he had known him and some of the other congressmen that I came later to know, that he had extensive network and exploited it. When they sent the delegation here, when I met them and presented a case why Ghana should be conferred with the hippie status, I was convinced that it would work because we were speaking to the choir. Mm. We had singing from the same hymn sheet. Yes, the same hymn right. sheet. What is the most important quality that Kofi Kulina Preku has that makes him believe that he will be an effective leader at this time, at this time for Ghana? I think my life is a story on its own. Where I have come from mm. and where I have reached is beyond my completely beyond my expectations. Okay. I've been blessed. Mm. And I have, I feel a sense of responsibility, as I said, to those for whom much is given, much is expected. I have had more than my fair share. And so I have within me a strong belief, such as a Methodist that I am, a quote in the Methodist hymn book, a charge to keep I have. A God to serve. I have replaced that to say a charge to keep I have. Mm. A God to serve and a nation to build. I have been placed in a position mm. that I believe I've had the opportunity to look at countries going through difficult times. Mm -hmm. I have a background in finance, in economics. I went to school. I got a PhD in it. I use it to work. Mm. in three universities in the United States, wrote a book on some of these issues that became a book that is being used as a textbook in American universities. But that is the theory. Mm. I've had practical experience in working with economies that have practically been destroyed, mm. such as was the case in Croatia after they seceded out of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. The country was devastated in a war. The United Nations needed people to go back there and rebuild that country. And I was one of those selected by Mr. Kofiana, who had never met, but he had seen my books that I've written, I've written two books, called me, said, I want you to be part of this delegation. It's mm. a very, very delicate, deli uh, it's not engineers that we need. Mm. Yes, we need them, but we need economists to begin a new planning. And you'll be in charge of that unit. I went. We work hard, and I think 
I made my small contribution to rebuild our country. It's a strong economy now. Second, in South Africa, where they were going to have the election, mm. the same thing they needed, as you will know for sure, where you said and you must know, that the blacks had never ruled, never had power, basically like slaves. Mm. All of a sudden, power is going to be turned over to them. Mm. They know next to nothing about governance, mm -hmm. about policy making. Very few educated. They needed people to go there. He called me again to go there. And I worked very hard. And we put structures in place. We educate them about budget, how to prepare a budget, how to prepare proposals, everything you can think of, from economics to politics. Spend my time there. That time I was even in the university. Took a leave, sabbatical leave from the university to go and do that in the US. So I have seen economic policy making. I have seen formulation of policy, mm. not just from textbook that I taught, but from a practical point of view. So your main, our nation today yeah, yeah. is faced with the most difficult period mm. in our nation's history in respect of the state of the economy. Yeah. And I believe that I have some contribution that I can put in. I have the leadership qualities mm. that will provide me what is the important ingredient to bring people there, assemble people in an open democratic so environment. Saying, so you believe that 2024 election will be an economy election? I don't have to tell you, you are living in this country. What is the critical issue in our country today? So obviously, life, li livelihoods, jobs, well, incomes. Well, that's an economic issue. So therefore, you are touting your economic credentials. Exactly. And that's, I didn't even finish telling about my experience. Mm. I have been a consultant for the World Bank, IMF, Economic Commission for Africa. European Union is a great partner to ECOWAS in terms of financing our program. And I work with them. And I work with all the major institutions that deal with the issues that we are confronted with. I, I have learned something. And I believe I can make an input to bring back, as our president said, the economy of Ghana. And I intend to win we'll, this election to we'll, bring it back. We'll take a break. When we come back, I'll finally ask him about his message for delegates. So far, we've worked our way a bit of history. We're talking also now about the economy and issues around his own competence and his message for the general Ghanaian voter. But what about delegates? What kind of candidate do they want? What, what is the mood of MPP delegates? And we'll deal with some of those issues when we come back. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest, Dr. Kofi Kunoda Preku. I could feel the passion in the last submission. I think when I ask you to talk about why you want to be president, the energy is still there. I feel it. But some, what of those who say, look, we need a younger person to be president. Um, I'm not saying you are the oldest person on the ticket, but it's like, you know what? You've done your quota. Let a younger man or woman. What would, what would be your answer to those people? My work is not done. <laughs> I already told you, I have a charge that I want to keep. Mm. And I want to help build a better Your work plan. is not done. Not at all. And I, how do, you, do I look like? Well, I, well, we can only look what's on the pink sheet. No, 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 it's not. How old do you think I look? Look, I read a story this week about the statistical service releasing a report. They call it the NEER, not in employment, not in education, and not in training, NEET. Between ages 15 and 24, 25% of that population is not in school, they're not in employment, they're not in training. That's serious, right? Our population is bulging at the bottom. We're That's a young true. country. The average Ghanaian is 19 years old. Yeah. So it's fine to have good ideas and fine to have passion, but do, do we need a 69-year-old to be our president? You'll be 70 by next year. Don't you think that the, the fabric of the society and the average age requires a much younger person? Well, that will be for this, the voters to decide. But I believe that I am very much alert. I have experience that I believe is needed. 
somebody who has better one, they will have a chance to vote. I sincerely believe there can be a better time for anybody than me. The other question there position. is that the, the nature of the delegates has also changed. So for one, you have more people voting. But when I look at the voting college, particularly for the November one, polling station executives, five. So there's uh, over 200,000 people. The demographic, the, yeah, the demographic of that 200,000, you can say it's also much younger mm -hmm. than the first group. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of these people may not even know you. Ah, that is for you to say and for me to prove you, are, you wrong. They do know me. They do know me. You know, if they don't know me, is it because that no, I I'm was saying that they may not remember? Look, I am telling people that my job yeah. is to let them know, such as I'm trying to let others today know who I am. I believe, yes. You can say that you want a younger person. At the end of the day, what is it that we are looking for? Is it a, a question of age or capacity? Capacity to deliver. I think I have the capacity to deliver prosperity to this country. Anybody that that is it, than anybody. So in what this what place. is what would be your most radical economic idea? Because lots of things have been tried in this country for the past how many years? We've gone to IMF seventeen times. So what will Apreku bring to the table, beyond what you've told me, in terms of economic salvaging that we don't know already? Well, we know, but if you know already, why are you here? We know it theoretically. <laughs> we haven't implemented it. So I'm going to give the practical. You say you know it theoretically. Yes. I want to give the practical. Give me an example touch. of one thing that ought to be done to salvage our economy. One thing that to be done? Million things that should be done, I can give you. One, yeah. Yeah. what is the state of our economy today? The state of our economy is, is, is there's disconnect. Disconnect between revenues that we have mm. and our expenditures. All right. And the most fundamental thing you have to do, even if you bring it to the practical home, you, the head of the family, your expenditures must take note of your income. There cannot be absolute disconnect between incomes and expenditures. Mm. And that is the biggest problem that we have in our country today. Mm. Our exp expenditures have no relationship with what we are generating. And so there is this imbalance. Mm. And this imbalance has been even made worse because of the environment, the recent international worldwide environment. It has exacerbated the problem. And so what we are facing today is that we can't sustain the system that we have. Mm. We can't maintain equality education. And it's like uh, which, uh, we, the egg or the chicken first. Mm. Which one do we have to do to give us the greatest impact in dealing with our problems? Okay. We don't have enough resources. I, I don't see. have enough resources. So what are you telling delegates and what are they telling you? Well, the delegates... Every delegate want to have an economy in which they can get a job, they can get a quality education, they can live a decent life in prosperity. So that is the dream, and I could add more. But basically, all of them want a country that they are running to, such as the United States and all the other countries. I made a joke recently that if today the slave ship Mm. That took our brothers and sisters back to the United States, mm -hmm. landed at our, uh, the, the beach in Accra mm -hmm. or whatever, the mm -hmm. coastline, and said that anybody who wants to go to America, mm -hmm. come and, 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 and join there and we are taking you there. How many people will be left in this country? I will be here. I will be here too. Maybe only the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is that we are running away yeah. from the poverty mm. that we have. Life is too good to be put in a situation where you can't see beyond your nose. And this is the essence of my message, my intervention. So you think delegates are looking for somebody who has an yes. econo economic in the, Well, who has the capacity to make the change. Because it takes more than just being an economist. You have to have the passion. Yeah. You have to be, have the part. There are economists all over the world. It doesn't mean they have transformed anything. I possess that passion. That but I these days, we are told delegates also want money. But I will get there. Do you have money? 
I will get there. No. Whoever goes around and said, I don't have money or I have money. I don't say I have money. I don't say I don't have money. Do they ask you for money? Of course, they do. Do you give them money? Why not? For what? It depends on what it is that they are asking. I get up in the morning. Just this morning, before we came, there were some women who came to my office. And they, Looking for what? They said they, they, their children are sick. And that's what we do half of the time. People come, you look at them, you can tell them they are not lying. And I can do this as a private person. I want to change the country before I became bankrupt too. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if it continues, you'll go bankrupt. Because <laughs> I feel like some days I'm so upset with myself. Why did I even come here? <laughs> because there's a lot of pressure on you as a political leader. Yes. And everybody thinks that you have to do them a favor <laughs> before they vote for you. <laughs> what are your, but does your family support this? Year? Because I'm sure... I don't I, know any if I were your son, women. I would say, Daddy, you've been in this thing for like since a uh, year. Why Even you if be, this is the Why you be a magana a year? Well, you are so right, but that's it. It's, I don't feel that way. Wow. But I think that my, my daughters <laughs> are campaigning, they are campaigning very, very, for you. very, very hard. Wow. They, are, they are the ones who told me that they had arranged this interview that, you guys, so they want you to from America, <laughs> they did. <laughs> so, okay, let me give you a minute to talk to delegates directly. Tell them yes. what, why they should vote for you. The delegates, I know your challenges that you are facing. Mm -hmm. It's not as the host said, mm. who can give you money today. They say, give a man a fish and he'll have food for today, mm. but take, teach him how to fish and he will have food forever. The issue is not what I can give to you today mm. for you to give me your vote. Mm -hmm. Because when you've done that, you have basically, mm -hmm. it's a transaction. Mm -hmm. Give me money and I'll give you vote. When that transaction is finished, nobody has any obligation. Mm -hmm. And I want to keep the obligation that brought me into politics okay. to make a change, not just to come and sign agreement with you today, mm -hmm. and I believe and said, I've, I've paid you already. No. So, yes, I know the difficulties they are going through. Uh -huh. There is a strong sense that the party, and it's not just the government, the party as a whole has not taken responsibility in addressing their concerns. Mm -hmm. And they feel very hurt and they are very angry. All right. Our responsibility is to keep hope alive for them, that it can change. Mm. And I believe it can change. It can change because human beings make change. Change do not happen on their own. Individuals, when challenged, mm -hmm. take actions and decisions. All right. That can change. And I'm saying that we can change it. Others have been through difficult times and they have changed. We have what it takes in this country to be prosperous. The current challenges that we have, we have had nothing to do right. with the reserves in our gold and oil at all. It's the capacity to exploit them. And that is what I'm uh, What number are you on the ballot? They haven't given They haven't them. balloted yet. Yes, we are going to do that later. I wish you well. Thank you. That was Dr. Kovikino Dapreku, former minister for many things and <laughs> leading member of the MPP, who says he's the right man to bring change within the MPP ambit. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. The Point of View is brought to you by Bellpack. Bellpack. Just perfect.